Olá, bem-vindos a mais um encontro da programação do Dia N, nossa festa de aniversário de Marx. É a segunda vez em quarentena, essa vez nós vamos comemorar os 203 anos de Marx, também de forma é, online. A programação desse ano é realizada pela Boitempo em parceria com a Fundação Rosa Luxemburgo e a Fundação Lauro Campos e Marielle Franco. No encontro de hoje, que está sendo transmitido simultaneamente pela TV Boitempo e pelo canal da Jacob em Brasil, teremos uma conversa entre Bascar Sunkara, Nancy Fraser e Oswaldo Codiola, com mediação de Daniela Mussi. Essa atividade marca o lançamento da edição brasileira do livro O Manifesto Socialista, do Bascar Sunkara, que eu vou mostrar aqui. É esse livro. E a nova edição de Teoria Econômica Marxista, uma introdução de Oswaldo Codiola, que eu não posso mostrar ainda porque está imprimindo. E nós vamos discutir hoje aqui também uma edição que não é um lançamento, mas é um livro recém-lançado pela Boitempo, que já foi várias vezes reimpresso, que é o Feminismo para os 99%, do qual Nancy Fraser é uma das autoras. É esse livro aqui. O Codiola organizou a nossa edição do Manifesto Comunista. É, é, foi a edição que inaugurou uma das coleções maiores e mais importantes da Boitempo, do qual, dos livros de Marx e Engels, o Manifesto Comunista é esse aqui. É, agora, de 3 a 10 de maio, nós temos a promoção do Dia M na Boitempo, em que todos os livros publicados por essa coleção, coleção Marx e Engels, além de uma seleção especial de obras sobre Marx e sobre o marxismo, estão com desconto de 20% a 40% na nossa loja virtual e em várias livrarias parceiras de, do país todo. Quem comprar livros nesse período, no site da editora, receberá também os cartões postais de Marx e vários temas desses livros, além de marcadores exclusivos, e esse cartaz que eu vou mostrar aqui agora também, um cartaz em A3, com uma ilustração do Cássio Loredano, de Marx e Engels. E para quem preferir ler em e-book, também as versões eletrônicas das nossas obras de Marx e Engels estão com, nas lojas com descontos de R$ 1,99 a R$ 19,90, além de desconto de 30% sobre os e-books a respeito de Marx e do marxismo. E não apenas no nosso site. Nesse momento difícil em que todo tipo de ataque e ameaça de taxação tem sido feitos ao livro, e à cultura, à ciência e toda a forma de conhecimento, é muito importante fortalecer a cadeia do livro como um todo. A Boitempo adotou é, uma campanha, já desde o ano passado, que é uma campanha que chama Adote uma Livraria. É uma campanha em que, comprando no nosso site, numa lista de, de livrarias que está à disposição, num banner em nosso site, vocês podem comprar em nosso site e essa venda ser feita para qualquer uma dessas livrarias. As informações estão no site de como é que essa, essa campanha funciona e, além de tudo, é importante procurar a livraria do seu bairro, a da sua cidade ou a livraria preferida e fazer compra diretamente por elas também. Nesse momento, isso é muito importante. É, vocês também podem se inscrever em nosso canal no Telegram para receber as notícias dos livros, dos eventos, dos autores. Tem um link que é t.me barra boitempo. Para quem se inscrever hoje, vai receber um pacote especial de figurinhas marxistas para usar no celular. Bom, é, os livros que estão sendo lançados, não só os lançados hoje, mas os que já foram lançados e vão ser discutidos aqui hoje, foram feitos a muitas mãos. E fazer uma lista breve, um resumo breve das pessoas que, que participaram é uma forma de prestigiar essa equipe incrível que nos cerca alguns há, há décadas já. Então, o Manifesto Socialista, que eu já mostrei aqui, foi traduzido pelo Arthur Renzo, com edição de Túlio Cauata e Carolina Mercedes na assistência, preparação da Maísa Cauata, revisão da Sandra Cato, diagramação da Nobuca e capa de Gabriela Eberle. O texto de orelha desse livro é do Victor Marques e a quarta capa de Glenn Greenwald e Naomi Klein. Já o novo livro do Codiola, que faz parte de uma série nova de livros introdutórios a ser coordenada pelo Rui Braga, foi editado pela Carolina, com revisão do Pedro Davolio, capa de Michael Nery e de animação do Antônio Kell. O texto de orelha desse livro é do Grespan, todos eles com produção, coordenação de produção da Lívia Campos. Os livros já lançados, mas que eu vou aqui falar brevemente, que é o Feminismo, ele foi traduzido pela Essi Candiani, a edição dele foi da Isabela Marcati, 
e a capa é da Lina Beltrão. O Manifesto Comunista foi traduzido, é, é uma tradução, na verdade, dividida, porque é uma tradução que foi feita pelo Álvaro Pina. É uma tradução que eu assino junto, porque a gente fez um cotejo com tradução alemã, com a edição italiana, espanhola, francesa, e a capa é com a ilustração de Gilberto Maringoni. E o texto de orelha do Michel Levy. Acho que era esse. Eu queria agradecer todas essas pessoas. E também, meu, meu, muito obrigada às equipes de comunicação, comercial e todos os que vivem desse ofício não muito prestigiado nos dias que correm, mas emocionante, que é fazer e difundir livros. Eu passo agora a palavra para Daniela Mussi, que vai mediar a conversa e desejo a todos um bom debate. Boa noite a todos e todas. É um imenso prazer participar dessa atividade. Eu me chamo Daniela Mussi, sou cientista social e professora do Departamento de Ciência Política da Universidade Federal do Rio de Janeiro e pesquisadora na área de História do Pensamento Político. Coube a mim, para a programação do Dia M, mediar essa mesa incrível que vocês vão assistir agora e que vai discutir manifestos comunismo, socialismo e feminismo para os 99%. O manifesto, como conhecemos, é um texto político, enxuto, programático, anunciador de premissas e horizontes. Nesse sentido, um livro vivo para emprestar uma expressão de Antônio Gramsci nos cadernos do cárcere. Hoje vamos falar de três livros vivos que foram traduzidos e publicados pela editora Boitempo ao longo do tempo, ao longo da sua trajetória editorial. O primeiro deles é o Manifesto Comunista, é, que vai ser comentado pelo professor Oswaldo Codiola. Também teremos a presença do Bascar Sunkara, a, falando sobre o Manifesto Socialista, esse bem mais recente, bem mais contemporâneo a nós. E também a professora Nancy Fraser, é, para a apresentação do Manifesto Feminismo para os 99%. Começaremos com o Bascar Sunkara, que vai apresentar esse livro recém-publicado pela editora Boitempo, Manifesto Socialista em Defesa da Política Radical em uma Era de Extrema Desigualdade. E aproveito para apresentar o Sunkara, que é fundador e editor da revista Jacobin, lançada lá em 2010, na outra era, antes, pré-pandêmica, e como articulista, o Bascar Sunkar escreveu para vários periódicos nos Estados Unidos, como New York Times, The Guardian, Vice, The Washington Post, e também é publisher de duas revistas muito interessantes, a Tribune e a Catalyst. Mora em Nova York e já esteve aqui no Brasil alguns anos atrás, apresentando a revista Jacobin e dialogando com muitos de nós a respeito do socialismo. Bem-vindo, Sunkara. É um prazer ter você com a gente aqui. Well, thank you so much for for having me. Um, I really appreciate how much effort and care was put into translating and publishing uh, the Socialist Manifesto into Portuguese. And I hope that comrades in Brazil and, and elsewhere are able to find something valuable in the book. Um, To begin with, uh, I guess I should say that initially I wasn't setting out to write a manifesto. Um, in fact, after I had already written the book, my publishers in the US told me they didn't think my initial title of socialism in our time was very marketable. So they uh, renamed it the Socialist Manifesto. Uh, but being a publisher myself, you know, I saw the market logic in it and I, and I went along for it. Um, but I would say the part of it that is kind of like a manifesto is that I tried to, um, in a portion of the book, uh, make an affirmative case for socialism, uh, which, which I guess has a spirit of manifesto. Uh, the middle parts of the book, are more of an illustrative history, uh, charting the rise of capitalism, uh, then socialism in different manifestations. Uh, then finally, the last third of the book is maybe something closer to a manifesto. But I begin by making uh, this case for socialism. And I do this rather than starting with a critique of capitalism. And 
obviously any critic of mine would probably say that this is my first uh, deviation from from Marx. You know, I, of course, consider myself a, a Marxist, but Marx uh, was very hesitant about writing recipes, as he put it, for the cook shops of the future, uh, because he was coming from an era dominated by the utopian socialists, uh, socialists who uh, just merely thought that they could exit and build a world outside of early industrial uh, capitalism, build their own socialist cooperatives and their communes, and that by the moral example of these alternatives, they would perhaps be able to uh, bring about a different world. Um, of course, Marx rooted his his theory of change into something uh, quite a bit different, you know, into what he saw as the, the logic and, and the material basis of, of, of history. Um, but I do think that today in the 21st century, many people believe that capitalism is bad. They, they understand our core moral and ethical argument against it. And they do want an alternative but in light of the failure of state socialism, I think it's vital for us to prove that socialism is indeed technically feasible and that the barriers in the way to our, us enacting socialism are primarily political. Uh, they're primarily the resistance of capitalists. And I think throughout much of the 20th century, socialists of various stripes had that confidence. The reformists thought, they could slowly take power and then seize the machinery of power, nationalize industry, and bring about an alternative political economy for much of the 20th century. And uh, then later on, uh, when they gave up that dream, they thought that they could at least have a model of ameliorating capitalism and radically changing political economy. Uh, and of course, state socialists had their model of, of change, of rupture, uh, and of a planned economy, and of a radically different political uh, system. It's today that we live in an era with seemingly without alternatives. So I thought it was important in the first part of my book, which is kind of a, a humorous, or it's meant to be humorous, um, second person narrative that aims to give a critique of the capitalist workplace. Uh, then through this critique of the capitalist uh, workplace, I uh, aims to explain how unions can lessen some of the exploitation inherent at the point of production. But it also aims to explain the limits of unionism, uh, then how a social democracy at the state level could lessen some of the exploitation of capitalism, but then explain the limits of that social democracy. And uh, then try to describe uh, both the transition from capitalist, capitalism to socialism, um, but then also an early social society. My kind of vision of five minutes after capitalism, what would the economics uh, and what would the political structure of a feasible socialism be? Um, and that social society would be based on the principles of worker control at the means of production, um, despite the maintenance of, of markets in a, in a few forms, um, but democratic planning at the commanding heights of the, the economy. From there, I, I, I describe the rise of, of capitalism. My depiction of the rise of capitalism, um, like a good portion of my book, uh, is filled with footnotes, but it, it's largely derivative because I draw heavily on the works of, in particular, the late um, Ellen Wood, uh, as well as Robert uh, Brenner. Um, and I try to describe not only the rise of capitalism, but the rise of the proletariat that came along with capitalism in the context in which Marx and Engels um, uh, come to develop their work. And I, and I mentioned both of their names because uh, I think in many ways, um, Engels was perhaps a Marxist before Marx, at least in the sense of uh, recognizing the tremendous potential and the particular um, conditions of, um, of this emerging working class that he had firsthand exposure to. And that was the context of his, his um, 1845 work condition of the, the working class in, in England. Um, so I, I try to use this as an accessible history because my intended audience was largely, at least in the Anglophone world, it was young activists around Jeremy Corbyn and around Momentum 
as well as young socialists around Bernie Sanders and around the Democratic Socialists of America. So I wanted to find a way to make this history vibrant, accessible, to explain the context of Marx and Engels' work, some of the the, the background to it. Um, also, even things like the dispute between Marxists and um, followers of LaSalle and those inspired by LaSalle, which, which played a major role in shaping uh, the modern uh, socialist thought, but, you know, is a seemingly abstract, antiquated, and old um, debate. Um, from there, the book gets gets quite a bit more um, historical. Uh, I described the rise of the Second International, um, the parties that in the late 19th century tried to um, turn somewhat abstract theory into concrete political uh, practice and the battles between revolutionaries and reformists within them. Um, but rather than try to pick a side, you know, if, if those of you who know my politics would know that I'm, of course, closer to um, to Luxembourg um, and at least um, Karl Kotsky up until um, uh, um, the 1910s, I mean, these these debates, but rather than try to sort of read history and backwards and try to come up with a certain style of, of his uh, writing this history, which which aims to just relitigate debates and try to say, if only they had formed a party earlier, if only this, if only this, if only that, then we would have had a proper workers revolution in, in Germany. I just aim to explore the roots of this tension. So what are the, the roots of tension between a radicalizing political cadre in uh, the German SPD um, and also a somewhat more economistic uh, trade union bureaucracy. Uh, you know, what were the roots of this uh, bureaucratization about the party and trade unions? Why was bureaucracy logical? Why did it make sense for workers to try to consolidate gains? Why did it make sense for workers to try to avoid risky action? So in other words, obviously I'm someone who believes that rupture would have been a far better and less horrible for the world choice uh, compared to the, the decades of misery that happened in Europe after um, uh, the capitulation of the SPD um, in, in 1914. But rather than read it backwards moralistically, I think it's better to explore these, these tensions and to try to explore the dilemmas of collective action. Uh, so the question I'm asking is not why workers don't revolt more often, uh, as in what's wrong with their heads, what's wrong with their consciousness. But instead, I try to ask, why is collective action the exception rather than the rule? with a focus on under what conditions have workers revolted in the past? What was unique about those conditions in the past? Um, because revolt is, is, is much harder to do um, uh, because of the, the capacities afforded to workers in a capitalist political economy compared to the agency afforded to, to capitalists. Um, so I then go on um, in the book to describe uh, the Bolshevik Revolution um, and 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 how that that democratic workers' revolution um, gave birth to dictatorship and 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 also how it became uh, a model for socialists in the third world as a model to try to lift their countries out of underdevelopment. So I try to understand the real accomplishments of these systems on their own terms, while also trying to differentiate it from the initial emancipatory and I think democratic spirit of the socialist uh, movement. So in other words, I find it helpful to not only denounce what I would call as uh, someone from the anti-Stalinist left, I would call a Stalinist uh, system, but also to see it in the way that I understand maybe the developmental state that gave birth in Japan um, in the decades prior, in other words, um, as a success in its own terms, lifting a country out of development, but at a tremendous human cost and also at a cost to the very idea of uh, working class emancipation and, and democracy, the only true meaning of, of socialism. So, you know, I, I think that that in general, with these types of, um, of works, it's also important to, uh, for me, try to figure out what's usable in this tradition going forward. And so much of what we do uh, today as socialists, whether we're in uh, 
we're the far left of social democratic parties, whether and we're in formations to the left of social democracy, or whether we're we're stuck in no man's land like uh, socialists in the United States are. Uh, so much of our demands are fighting for immediate social democratic uh, reforms. So regardless of what we think about um, the um, whether or not rupture would be would be preferred or 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 not. Um, you know, we are are stuck in this conjuncture where we have to figure out how do we make socialism out of social democratic reform? Uh, so I do try in the book to spend a lot of time explaining the roots of not only pre-war, but also post-war social democracy with a focus on Sweden. And I think, in other words, um, I, what I'm trying to do there is I'm trying to reincorporate social democracy into the socialist tradition. And I'm trying to see whether or not there was a left social democratic or more revolutionary tradition that could have arose not as a separate stream from that of social democracy, but from it. And the conclusion that I come to looking at the radicalization that happened in Sweden in the late 60s and early 70s um, is that there was the potential for something more radical to come out of social democracy and that the gains of social democracy far from work making workers more complacent um, and more willing to settle for the limits of the capitalist political economy actually made them restless and gave them certain capacities that made it possible for them to fight for something uh, different so in other words i think we need a left that can learn just as much from sweden in 1971 as we can from Russia in 1917. And, and I think that it's, it's important for us, even while we're critical of both traditions, to understand uh, both of those, those trajectories. And, and I'll just wrap up by saying that, you know, at the end of the book, I, I do cover socialism in America and the age old question of why there's no labor party um, in the US and why in the US socials have been made to be just a permanent um, junior partner in, in, in essence and in, in coalition with with the uh, reforming tendencies of a certain part of American um, liberalism. Um, but that's not a, the major focus of my book. Uh, the major focus of my book is essentially to lay out through this illustrative history, a political practice going forward uh, that I think is, is class oriented. Uh, I think is rooted around a lot of the the old tools of the trade union and the mass party and then these other um, somewhat antiquated tools, but it's aiming to develop uh, vibrant social movements and to advance the fight against oppression and to broaden the scope and vibrancy of class struggle rather than to merely confine it to the point of production or to the realm of electoralism. Uh, and the last thing I should say is that with um, the the end of my book, I do try to address um, the environment and the climate change as the main moral imperative of why we can't afford to be patient in our struggle against capitalism. Uh, and that's a paradox, of course, in that I think the lesson of my history and the lesson of my work is, in essence, a advocacy of what you'd call a kind of uh, Kotskyan strategy of patience. But um, in the end, I think that uh, I come to the conclusion that far more urgent and necessary work is ahead of us uh, because the conditions might seem to favor us today, but over the course of the next 20, 30 years, as we face the effects of climate change, I think we'll be in much more fertile terrain for the populace, right? So if we're in a condition today where the Trumps and Bolsonaros and others of the world can, uh, within the logic of false scarcity, whip up fervor against immigrants and to say there's not enough to go around there's not enough to give to the to the uh, poor and to the working class imagine what kind of rhetoric they'll be able to muster when there's actual real scarcity and there's real mass flows of climate refugees and the and the, the um and the the um the rest so i'll leave it there um uh with that you know obviously i wrote a book called The Socialist Manifesto, but I certainly consider myself uh, a Marxist. And I, I think I may, for better or worse, maybe for worse, I'm a somewhat orthodox uh, Marxist. So I don't judge by the title alone, because I, I certainly wasn't trying to say that uh, 
that we are in need of something radically different. I do think we're in need of new tactics and new language and new ways to to fight the old battles with uh, with a few new tools. But but I think the, the dream of, of working class emancipation and freedom of Marxist day is still our fight today. Uh, obrigado, Basca, pela sua apresentação incrível. É, só estou aqui formulando questões a respeito dela. Poderia ouvir muito você seguir ouvindo a experiência é, de composição desse livro. Eu vou passar a palavra agora para o professor é, Oswaldo Codiola, que é o nosso segundo convidado e que foi o editor da publicação, da primeira publicação do Manifesto Comunista pela editora Boitempo. O é, Codiola é historiador, é professor titular da Universidade de São Paulo é, na área de História Contemporânea e é também pesquisador na área de Marxismo, América Latina, Movimento Operário, Capitalismo e Socialismo. Bem-vindo, professor Oswaldo Codiola, a palavra está contigo. Então, muito Sim. obrigado, Daniela. É, boa noite ou boa tarde a todos os que está, nos estão assistindo. E eh, eu tenho uma tarefa singular, porque os outros dois membros desta mesa vão falar de textos que eles escreveram. E eu vou falar de um texto que não escrevi, eu não escrevi o Manifesto Comunista, certo? Eu apenas preparei uma edição. Fiz, sim, um longo prefácio, talvez tão longo quanto o próprio Manifesto Comunista. Pus nele eh, todos os prefácios posteriores escritos por Marx e Engels e alguns notáveis prefácios escritos por revolucionários posteriores à geração de Marx e Engels. Nessa edição, que a Boitempo gentilmente acolheu a minha ideia de fazer essa edição, quando foram 150 anos do Manifesto Comunista. Posteriormente, eu tive a honra de saber que essa edição inaugurou uma série de livros, uma série publicada pela Boitempo, das obras de Marx e Engels, em muitos casos, com traduções novas, no caso do Manifesto também se tratava de uma nova tradução, mais precisa, mais exata, e eu me sinto muito honrado de ter inaugurado essa, essa série. Agora, nessa edição do Manifesto, eu cometi um erro, e eu vou partir de analisar esse erro rapidamente, certo? Porque o eh, que eu vou não incluir, eu incluí o Manifesto, e os prefácios posteriores ao manifesto. Eu deveria ter incluído a organização para a qual o próprio Marx escreveu o Manifesto Comunista, que se chamava Liga dos Justos, certo? Que a partir da redação do manifesto passou a se chamar Liga dos Comunistas. Por que foi um erro? Porque Marx acreditava que com a redação dos princípios do comunismo por parte de Engels, a tarefa que lhes tinha sido proposta, que era a de redigir um manifesto para a Liga dos Justos, estava satisfeita. No entanto, nem ele, nem o próprio Engels, ficaram satisfeitos com esses princípios do comunismo. E o manifesto foi crítica à tentativa de superar esses princípios do comunismo. E nessa superação está toda a chave da singularidade do manifesto comunista como documento na história da humanidade e na história do pensamento. Qual era a característica dos princípios de comunismo? Que, repito, se fizermos uma nova edição, nós deveríamos incluir. Os princípios de comunismo de Engels partiam... É evidente que o Manifesto Comunista não foi o primeiro texto comunista, certo, da história. Já havia Babeuf, eh, Buonarroti, que tinha sido um discípulo de Babeuf, e outros textos de Blanqui e outros revolucionários, eh, digamos, anteriores a Marx e Engels. A peculiaridade é que, em geral, os textos anteriores ao Manifesto Comunista partiam de grandes ideias. Partiam da ideia de eu vou explicar a vocês o que é o comunismo, o socialismo, e o socialismo se baseia na natureza humana, que é boa, mas que corrompe... Desde o contrato social de Rousseau em diante, este era o método. Se expunha uma grande ideia e como essa ideia podia ser aplicada ao mundo, ou podia encontrar seu lugar no mundo. E o Manifesto Comunista tem a singularidade de fazer uma operação exatamente contrária. O Manifesto Comunista 
Los principios del comunismo de Engels ainda introducían al lector mediante la frase vamos a explicar o qué diablo es o tal do comunismo y por qué que el comunismo es importante y necesario para la humanidad. Y Marx hizo lo contrario. En vez de explicar una idea, luego de cara, él fala de un facto. ¿Y cuál es ese facto? Un fantasma percorre Europa, o fantasma del comunismo. Es un facto. A burguesía tiene miedo y soa o alarme. A aristocracia treme. Las dinastías, ¿cierto?, senten que su mundo está acabando. En una palabra, todos los dirigentes del mundo, así como la nueva clase, a burguesía, que estaba ascendiendo socialmente, y que tiene tenido un momento de ascensión en particular con la Gran Revolución Francesa de 1789, todos ellos tremían parte de ese fato y dice no, no voy a explicar lo que es el comunismo, porque aparentemente ya se sabe lo que es el comunismo. Porque si no se solvese lo que es el comunismo, ¿cierto? Las personas, los aristócratas, las dinastías, la burguesía, no tremería diante del comunismo. Ellos saben lo que es el comunismo. Entonces, por tanto, voy a intentar explicar y pasa a explicar por qué el comunismo es necesario. Y, dice, y parte de esta idea central, y ve a parte que diríamos teórica del manifesto comunista. Y esta parte teórica del manifesto comunista también no comienza con una exposición de teoría, sino que comienza por un fato. ¿Y cuál es ese fato? La historia de la humanidad, hasta el presente, no ha sido otra cosa que la historia de la lucha de clases. Punto. Es un fato. Posteriormente pasa a explicar a sucesivas fases de la lucha de clases a lo largo de la historia para concluir la lista por su peculiaridad de que dentro del régimen capitalista, debido a la libertación de las fuerzas productivas sociales, si gestan, como no acontecerá en los modos de producción precedente, las condiciones materiales para la realización del comunismo, que es una aspiración mucho más bella do que el capitalismo. Ideas comunistas, como todos los historiadores del comunismo, sobre todo los más antiguos, ya existían en sociedades mucho anteriores al capitalismo. Y dice, la peculiaridad del capitalismo es que al libertar las fuerzas productivas sociales de todos los grillones que le impuñan o regímenes baseados la exploración de, fuerza de, de una fuerza de trabajo que no era libre, ¿cierto? Al dejar entre los hombres apenas o interés y no, al colocar o centro de exploración, ¿cierto? La relación entre capital y el trabajador asalariado, cría por esa libertación total de las fuerzas de producción las bases para la realización de una sociedad basada en la abundancia y baseada, por tanto, en la posibilidad de socialización de los medios de producción como condición para su desarrollo. Muy bien. Esto es la peculiaridad teórica del manifesto comunista, y la peculiaridad decisiva, ¿cierto? En los principios del comunismo, por ejemplo, porque de, o, muchas otras cosas mudaron después del manifesto comunista, en los principios del comunismo a un largo capítulo dedicado a criticar el socialismo. Dice que el socialismo era porcaría que es tentativa de recauchutar el régimen burgués y que el comunismo es la superación del socialismo. Posteriormente, esta idea, el eh, propio Marx, ¿cierto? El socialismo muda de sentido, ¿cierto? Y pasa a ser considerado a etapa inferior del comunismo o el comunismo a etapa superior del socialismo. Pero esta no es la cuestión decisiva. La cuestión decisiva es que Marx coloca en el manifesto comunista que el comunismo no es una idea a ser imposta al mundo, es una realidad que está surgiendo de la propia producción capitalista. Y se trata de una idea extremadamente audaciosa para su tiempo. Y si estoy lembrando estas cuestiones históricas, es porque ellas continúan siendo actuales, ¿cierto? En particular cuando se lanza la idea de que tenemos que escribir un nuevo manifesto comunista, ¿cierto? ¿Cuál es la idea central? La idea central es la siguiente. O capitalismo, que en ese momento, como régimen de producción dominante, apenas existe en Inglaterra, en Francia es ainda embrionario, en Alemania él es ainda embrionario, en Italia, en el norte de Italia él es ainda embrionario, ¿cierto? 
ese nuevo modo de producción cría las premisas materiales y cría las bases del comunismo dentro de la propia sociedad existente. Esta idea no tenía sido expuesta por ninguém hasta ese momento. Y constituye, ¿cierto?, a grande novedad de la aproximación histórica de Marx, ¿cierto?, y la nueva fundamentación del comunismo, que después fue sintetizada o simplificada con la idea a pasaje del comunismo, del socialismo, del comunismo, del socialismo específicamente por Engels, de utopía a ciencia. Muy bien. Ahora, una vez intentando explicar el manifesto comunista, en uno de los varios lanzamientos, ¿cierto?, que he utilizado el manifesto comunista, justamente, yo cansado de hablar del manifesto comunista, lancé una provocación para el público. Y le dice, ¿cuándo el manifesto comunista fue escrito y publicado? Pregunté. ¿O qué había más en no el mundo? ¿Proletarios, en no el sentido moderno, proletarios industriales o esclavos? Todo el mundo me olió, porque todo el mundo sabe que el manifesto comunista termina con la famosa imperativo de proletarios del mundo univos. Y le digo, había... 10 o 20 o 30 veces más escravos do que proletarios, porque la esclavitud aún era vigente. No Brasil, no Estados Unidos de América, en boa parte do Caribe y de América Central, en boa parte de África, en boa parte de los países árabes, ¿cierto? Y en, até en bolsões de Europa. Y no en tanto, Marx no faló escravos do mundo unidos, faló proletarios do mundo unidos. O que en la época y si consideradas a conjunto de la población mundial, era una propuesta audaciosa de emancipación, porque presupunía que el modo de producción esclavocrata y los otros producción baseados en la servidumbre, en el trabajo compulsorio, irían a ser eliminados por el capitalismo, que criaba una nueva clase, a clase de los proletarios asalariados, no digo no apenas industriales, asalariados en general, y que esta clase era portadora ¿Cierto? Da revolución para la sociedad del futuro. Yo quiero completar esta exposición con dos ideas. La primera es la idea siguiente, que están lanzadas para el debate. El manifesto comunista, o comunismo propuesto del manifesto comunista, es un correctivo a ser aplicado al mundo, o es algo que surge del propio desarrollo del mundo. La verdad es las dos cosas, pero es notable, ¿cierto?, que una de las críticas de que fue objeto, no las críticas, el manifesto comunista, y no por la derecha, que lógicamente a derecha se opone al manifesto comunista, ¿cierto?, a cualquier idea de comunismo, sino dentro del inglés de origen egipcia, eh, Eric Kopsbaum, ¿cierto?, que tiene un texto sobre el manifesto comunista que dice que el manifesto comunista se divide en dos partes. Una que es análisis del desarrollo capitalista y el análisis de las sociedades de clases anteriores al capitalismo, que es absolutamente científica, materialista, diríamos en los termos marxistas, vulgares, ¿cierto? Y otra parte que no es materialista ni científica, que es la idea del comunismo. ¿Por qué? Porque dice Hoffman, de toda análisis feita por Marx, no surge naturalmente que el comunismo sea necesariamente o arremate de todo ese desarrollo histórico. Esta es una idea que no fue criticada en un libro que fue publicado, eh, fue por la Tempo, que se llama Cómo mudar el mundo, un artículo de Marx sobre el manifesto comunista. En la verdad, hay una confusión y yo oso criticar Hoffman, porque lo que Marx llega a decir es lo siguiente, que el comunismo surge do propio desarrollo, más que no va a surgir automáticamente, surge do propio desarrollo del capitalismo, más no va a surgir automáticamente, ¿cierto? Sino que exige de una revolución que los proletarios criados por el capitalismo tendrán que realizar. La segunda idea es de que el manifesto comunista es genial, y esto reconocen algunos enemigos del comunismo, es genial porque en su desarrollo histórico acerca del nacimiento y desarrollo del capitalismo, supera todo lo que tenía sido escrito hasta ese momento y algunos viran no más comunista y posteriormente, en la obra de Marx Capital, una verdadera apología del capitalismo y apología 
do desenvolvimento capitalista como da análise marxista como uma apologia antecipada do que veio a se chamar de globalização. As razões que habitualmente se supõem, de que Marx nunca faria apologia do capitalismo e nunca faria apologia da globalização. É uma ideia errada, porque Marx não faz apologia do capitalismo e também não faz apologia do proletariado. Simplesmente mostra as contradições e que o comunismo será, independentemente de como estas forças se compõem, se, se confrontam, a única saída progressiva e possível para a humanidade do confronto suscitado pelo capitalismo. Mas a ideia de apologia é estranha ao método do Manifesto Comunista e ao método de Marx. Para concluir, eu quero dizer o seguinte. Eu li com extrema atenção o texto de Vascar, que também parte de um fato, certo? Mas parte de um fato mais simples. Ele diz que está escrevendo este livro em 2018, certo? E chega a falar, inclusive, de Bon Jovi, um cantor de rock, certo? E está bem, porque parte de um fato, certo? En ese sentido, no parte de una idea, y voy a explicar el socialismo nuevamente a luz de las nuevas condiciones. Parte de un fato, ¿cierto? Se puede partir inclusive de Bon Jovi para explicar el socialismo hoy en día, ¿cierto? Yo particularmente no gosto de Bon Jovi, ¿cierto? Y me parece que Vázquez también no es grande fanático de él, ¿cierto? Mas la cuestión efectivamente es la siguiente. Muita... Después del manifesto comunista, no es prácticamente no tuvimos más manifestos. ¿Por qué? Porque tuvimos programas, o programa de la Primera Internacional, que fue redigido por el propio Marx, o programa de la Segunda Internacional, o programa de la Tercera Internacional, o programa de la Cuarta, y algunos propusieron un programa para la Quinta Internacional, ¿cierto? Y abandonamos la idea de manifesto. Y, no entanto, la idea de manifesto ahora está voltando. Y nos tenemos que nos preguntar por qué. Y no tenemos ahora un manifesto socialista, un manifesto feminista, Poderíamos tener un manifesto negro, y tenemos sin números, y podríamos tener todo tipo de manifestos, ¿cierto? Porque efectivamente, lo que caracteriza el capitalismo de hoy, o desenvolvimiento capitalista de hoy y a sus contradicciones, es que evidenció o conjunto de las contradicciones que ya estaban embutidas en el desenvolvimiento capitalista como nunca antes en toda la historia del capitalismo. Me parece que esta es la que está un central y a que nos debe orientar para pensar o que no estemos que hacer no presente, ¿cierto? Y probablemente, o segredo del presente es que no tengamos que no reescribir el manifesto comunista, más escribir un monte de manifestos, ¿cierto? Y pensarnos cómo ese monte de manifestos no nos lleva a una dispersión, no enfrentamiento del capitalismo, aunque se llama una dispersión fruto de las políticas identitarias, más a una unificación de todos los movimientos que fue delineado originalmente en 1848 pelo Manifesto Comunista. Por tanto, este es un convite a la lectura, a releitura del Manifesto Comunista, ¿cierto? que es un documento que no perde a su actualidad y a un debate que tal vez realicemos entre nos. Muy obrigado y disculpen si me excedí no tiempo. No, usted fue puntualísimo. Muito obrigada, professor. É, vou passar, então, a nossa convidada final dessa, dessa mesa incrível, que é a professora Nancy Fraser. É uma alegria, uma honra mediar esse debate com, com a professora Fraser, que é, para nós, muitos de nós brasileiros, especialmente pesquisadores do marxismo nas universidades, uma interlocutora né, tanto de marxistas como de teóricos críticos aqui no Brasil, então é uma honra muito grande recebê-la. É, a professora Fraser está aqui para comentar um manifesto do qual ela é coautora, que é o Manifesto Feminismo para os 99%, que também é de autoria da Cinzia Rusa e da Titi Batacharya. E aproveito para apresentá-la, embora fosse totalmente desnecessário, Nancy Fraser é uma filósofa, professora titular da Universidade de New School for Social Research nos Estados Unidos, em Nova York, é uma teórica crítica feminista e autora de uma vasta obra de teoria e análise do avanço do neoliberalismo, da globalização, da justiça, do reconhecimento e da distribuição, é, especialmente nos Estados Unidos, mas não apenas então, passo a palavra à professora Fraser para fazer a sua fala. 
Thank you very, very much, uh, Daniela, for that introduction. And thanks to the the, uh, the whole team at uh, Boy Tempa for organizing this um, really interesting panel. I'm um, so glad that I got to hear the other two speakers. I have many, many thoughts about what they've said, and I'm eager to get to uh, the discussion with them. But first, I, I do want to take a few minutes to talk about um, this manifesto. And as Daniela said, it, it, I have to start by saying that it is a co-authored piece of work with uh, two other authors, Chinzia Rutsa and Tithi Bhattacharya. And um, although we hammered out uh, whatever differences we had in order to write it, um, it's inevitable that what I say now will probably uh, put my own personal spin on it. And it could be the case. I'd, I'd love to know if this would be true, that if, uh, if you had either of the other authors here, they might introduce it differently. Anyway, um, I want to say, first of all, that it is a piece of agitational writing above all. And, um, you know, for a philosopher, that represents a, a big uh, uh, shift in genre. Um, but I did have the experience in um, of, of somehow feeling young again, uh, feeling that uh, that somehow all those leaflets and, and things that I, I wrote back in the 1960s that that I could still write in this uh, agitational way. OK, um, it's agitational. And yet I, I, I hope and I believe and I tried very hard to make sure that it actually has some real conceptual content, that there's a real argument here, um, although uh, and a lot of theory built in, although I hope that it's uh, a, an argument and fear and theory that is sort of worn lightly so that it remains a very accessible text with uh, that is uh, quite concrete. And it is also, this is really important, um, an intervention. It's an intervention in a very specific uh, political conjuncture. Interestingly, I think it was written at just about the same time that Bhaskar was writing his. So I would describe this uh, conjuncture as uh, uh, the, uh, the collapse of uh, of neoliberal hegemony uh, in the United States, uh, what that meant was the collapse of, of, a, of a form of progressive neoliberalism, which was that of the centrist wing, the neoliberal wing of the Democratic Party, the Clinton Obama wing. Uh, so we were writing in the uh, soon after the 2016 presidential election in which we had the sort of two, you know, let's call them, uh, for want of a better word uh, at first sight, two populist revolts, the, the right populist revolt of Trump and, and make America great again, the less left populist revolt of uh, Bernie Sanders. And what that meant was that people were no longer buying uh, the idea that um, the sort of free trade financialization uh, uh, transition to a, a, a low wage service sector economy, that all those important changes in the character of capitalism that we associate with the term neoliberalism, people were no longer uh, buying that 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 was um, what was needed to you know, make things uh, make a good life. Uh, and with the collapse of that hegemonic perspective came also a collapse of the sort of apparent self-evidence that liberal feminism, liberal meritocratic feminism, the feminism of the progressive managerial class, uh, uh, sorry, of the professional managerial class, that that was the fem that that was what feminism was, just as uh, other sectors of the population were looking for out of the box solutions for populist alternatives, whether left or right. So there was a lot of um, feeling among feminists that we sort of come to the end of a certain road and needed to make, uh, an, or, or at least to contemplate the possibility of a, of a different path. And sensing the opening then for an alternative to this hegemonic liberal meritocratic feminism, we decided to write this manifesto and uh, 
to basically uh, offer uh, a course correction. It's time to make a big turn in the feminist movement. Now, I should say, and I thought of this in listening to the other speakers, um, we did not, in doing this, we did not face the task of explaining why feminism was needed. We were speaking primarily, but not only to people who already considered themselves feminists. Um, we were trying to explain why the dominant form of feminism was problematic and why feminism should become anti-capitalist. Um, we used populist language, the language of the 99% and the 1%. This was the language that Occupy uh, introduced into the US landscape and that uh, soon was used uh, throughout the world. It's not class language. It's much, much less precise. And in the end, it's much less sociologically adequate than class language, but it has tremendous mobilizing power in that moment. It was the language Sanders was using. Um, and um, we thought this is a, um, a language that we can use. And I want to just say for myself here, I'm not a populist. I think of left populism as a kind of potentially transitional formation and route to democratic socialism, maybe somewhat like uh, Bhaskar thinks of social democracy. Um, so, um, I mean, I, I just want to say that um, my own view, and this is doesn't, is not really uh, going beyond what we say in the manifesto here, but my own view is that in the end, a populist sociology of the 1% and the 99% will not be adequate for the kind of anti-capitalist feminist movement or any other form of anti-capitalist or socialist movement. In the end, it will have to develop some uh, more adequate um, sociological um, terminology. But we thought, let's run with this rhetorically and see how far we can push it. Um, it's, um, it, 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 it's, it's written with the idea that feminism and even the feminism for the 99%, which we sketch here, is not the, the sole player in the kind of social movement or political movement that we need to solve our current problems. Feminism is at best one strand of that movement, along with environmentalist strands, along with anti-racist strands, along with uh, various other uh, forms of working class and trade union uh, strands, and so on and so forth. But we, um, we chose in this piece of writing to speak to that current, to the feminist current as it already existed, and to convince it to give up any form of single issue feminism uh, and to try to see itself as a as as a one participant in a broader social struggle whose target in the end was capitalism. Now, um, we unlike Bhaskar, we do try to argue that capitalism is bad in our manifesto. And um, I would say that my own hunch is that, that that is not exactly obvious to many people. Here, this is maybe a slight disagreement. Um, I would say that um, it, it's pretty obvious that um, what, what's going on in, let's say, US society or Brazilian society or where, wherever people are is very bad. But I think it already takes quite a bit of sort of uh, conceptual sophistication to be able to trace all of that to capitalism, uh, even to understand that there's one single social system that underlies and indeed generates all the various many, many, many different kinds of ills, of injustices, of irrationalities, 
of, uh, of forms of crises. Uh, and so what we wanted to do was convince feminists that there was no way that you could uh, actually understand, analyze, let alone a politically address or, or solve the list of, of, of feminist complaints, let's say, um, without thinking deeply about capitalism, that all of them were essentially implicated in capitalism, that capitalism was the name of the social totality in which gender relations are embedded and in which gender asymmetry is hardwired for reasons I'll explain. But I would make the same argument with respect to racial imperial fault lines and forms of oppression that those two um, find their, their roots in capitalism. And I would say the same thing about uh, environmentalism and of course, we already have the the, uh, the the sort of more orthodox Marxian idea about class exploitation being a non-accidental, right, hardwired feature of a capitalist society. We think uh, that the same is true for gender asymmetry, for male domination, for women's subordination, whatever you want to call it. And in this, um, we actually... Um, uh, I think feel a great kinship with Engels, whose great, great work, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, argued uh, that even though male dominance was much older than capitalism, there was something specific about the organization about of a capitalist society with its privatization of the family and of the whole arena of social reproduction that lay behind the specific forms of male dominance that we have to deal with, which are not the same as patriarchy and, you know, uh, in nomadic tributary empires or, or whatever. Um, so um, we wanted then to show why capitalism is the root cause, why feminism needs to be anti-capitalist and why it needs to ally with other anti-capitalist forces in contemporary society, because you can call it a happy coincidence, ironically speaking, uh, that all the serious ills of our society and this all of the concerns of all the populations that are mobilized in struggle today can be traced back to the deep structure of capitalism. So uh, the, the, fem the feminist, this manifesto is organized in the form of 11 theses. Uh, they're quite short, three, four pages each. Uh, it does have a, um, a, a section at the end, which we call a post face, which delves um, a little more deeply into some of the reasoning behind the theses. Um, but let me just say uh, a bit about, I. I have five minutes left, right? Yeah. Uh, let me just say um, a bit uh, more, um, though, about what we mean by capitalism. We see ourselves here as um, presupposing and developing what I've elsewhere called an expanded view of capitalism. Capitalism is not just an economic system and not just a way of organizing the economy or the sphere of production. Capitalism is much larger. It's, a, it's an entire social order that organizes the relation between production and reproduction. It organizes the relation between the market and the state or the economy and the political system. It organizes the relation between human society and non-human nature. It organizes the relationship between exploited wage labor and so-called doubly free uh, labor and expropriated unfree and dependent labor. And I really appreciated Osvaldo's point about um, slaves. Uh, uh, a huge amount of capitalist labor is even today unfree, although, although not legally uh, enslaved, uh, but deeply dependent and, it, and, and, and is coerced uh, and is regulated not through legal wage contracts, but through all sorts of 
non-contractual uh, coercion. That's still the case. Um, okay, so capitalism is bigger than in the economy. And the part of the story that is of special interest to feminists is the story about production and reproduction. I mean, it should be of interest to everyone. Uh, but um, for us, this is the fundamental deep structure of capitalist society, as deep and as structural as the relation between capital and labor at the point of production. Uh, and this for us is the, uh, the sort of linchpin of gender asymmetry, uh, not in a reductive sense, but we think, and we try to do it in the various 11 theses that are uh, elaborated in the book, we think that um, uh, issues like women's position vis-a-vis uh, -vis the labor market and unequal pay, for example, or women's vulnerability to gender-specific violence, for another example, uh, that, that things like this uh, are um, cannot be understood without reference to this fundamental sharp structural division between production and reproduction. And I should add that that is specific to capitalism. No previous society sharply institutionalized these things as totally separate in the way that capitalism does. And the effect is to render women subordinate, not only uh, to capital, which helps itself to our unwaged labor, our care work, uh, and often depletes it and causes us uh, to live like crazy people. Uh, but um, we also become uh, subordinated um, even to working class men. And this is uh, uh, an issue that has to be uh, faced politically. It introduces some complications into the way we normally think about class struggle. I would say, like uh, Boskark, who says he's for class struggle, social democracy, I would say we are for class struggle feminism and, uh, and, and class struggle politics in general. Um, but um, we are interested in um, thinking uh, uh, just as, as we have an expanded view of capitalism, an expanded view of what counts as a capitalist crisis, an expanded view of what counts as a contradiction of capitalism, including the care depletion that we see happening right now, especially ramped up under COVID. Um, all of those things, even what counts as socialist feminism changes uh, when you uh, take this, this broader view. So we see ourselves as a uh, building on Marx and Engels and, um, and, 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 and especially on Engels idea that, that it's inadequate to uh, define socialism as a, a socialization or collective ownership of the means of production that it also has to mean socialization or collectivization of housework and social reproduction. Uh, that's fundamental, but, but it, it also has to involve uh, changing the whole relation to nature, uh, changing the whole relation between politics and, econo and, uh, and economics. So um, again, it's an intervention in a moment that I think is, uh, we're, I think we're still in, I'll close again with another conjunctural point and then I'll end. Um, I think we're, we're uh, still in this Gramscian moment of interregnum uh, we, in some places, I mean, you still have uh, Bolsonaro in power. Uh, we uh, got rid of Trump. We haven't exactly swung back to progressive neoliberalism. We're in a kind of uneasy compromise formation uh, between uh, the uh, neoliberal wing of the Democratic Party and the Sanders wing. Uh, and um, I don't think this compromise can last very long. I think it's, it's deeply riven. Uh, um, but um, what I'm determined, at least in the case of, of this feminist manifesto, is to try to make the case that when that, uh, when that compromise formation breaks down, that uh, the bulk of feminists need to end up in the Sanders-like camp and not back 
with the progressive neoliberals. I'll stop there. Muito bom. Obrigada, professora Fraser. Uh, como vocês a, que estão nos assistindo já devem ter percebido, são muitas as questões que foram endereçadas nas três intervenções e unificá-las numa proposta de discussão é impossível. Eu não vou nem tentar fazer isso. É, só vou fazer um comentário geral e algumas perguntas individuais para cada participante. E na sequência também abrir para que se o professor Oswaldo, é, né, a professora Nancy Fraser e o Bascar quiserem também perguntar é, ou comentar a fala um do, um, uns dos outros, possam ter espaço para isso. Uh, 2018 é uma conjuntura importante também aqui no Brasil, é, mas de fato é, nós aproveitamos melhor é, esse, esses ares que vêm hoje dos Estados Unidos depois do pós-Trump, né, da, da derrubada do Trump, é, muito melhor esses ares que, que, que vêm é, de vocês do que os que nós jogamos para o resto do mundo. Mas é uma conjuntura de derrota muito profunda para as forças democráticas e de esquerda no Brasil, é, ao mesmo tempo em que, paradoxalmente, Uh, se tem essa, essa primavera editorial nas esquerdas, né, de leitura, de retorno aos textos de Marx, de Engels, de Lenin, as biografias, as traduções, as novas produções editoriais que vão, de alguma forma, sendo uma espécie de ponto de, de encontro e de respiro para a cultura socialista, de esquerda, comunista, que também temos aqui no Brasil com uma, com uma trajetória bastante é, significativa, importante. Então, a pergunta geral que eu acho que podemos tentar responder desses dois contextos nacionais e que a discussão suscitou a mim é a quem endereçar manifestos hoje? Uh, e eu busquei isso muito, tanto no Manifesto Socialista como no Feminista, encontrei respostas, mas eu não sei se vocês concordam com elas, então eu vou colocar na forma de perguntas. É, como recolocar os temas da política e da análise é, teórica em termos práticos da ação e da organização coletiva? Uh, isso é um problema muito grande também entre nós aqui no Brasil, é, que não é respondido de uma forma simples. Gostaria que vocês comentassem a respeito disso. Para quem os manifestos voltam? A quem eles são é, escritos, endereçados? E aí pergunto é, para você, Basca, é, você apresenta o seu manifesto como uma defesa afirmativa, positiva é, do socialismo. Você poderia desenvolver um pouco mais essa estratégia retórica é, em, que, em quem você pensou quando escreveu esse livro? Quem você imaginava lendo as suas palavras? É, uma segunda pergunta, você fala de, um, de, de uma tomada de distância em relação a Marx, talvez até temporal, mais até do que do conteúdo, né? de um outro contexto linguístico, inclusive. Você poderia falar um pouco mais sobre como você enxerga essa equação ciência versus utopia nos dias atuais, né, a proporção que cada termo é, é, recebe nessa equação de um ponto de vista crítico, né, ou, ou proto-marxista, ou mesmo marxista. É, uma terceira pergunta, você falou sobre o estilo, né, o uso do humor, da autoironia no seu texto, e é muito legal isso, e aí eu gostaria se você saber se você pensa a respeito disso, do uso da linguagem como uma forma de ampliação do alcance da propaganda socialista hoje. E aí, em conexão, por fim, a essa pergunta, um balanço da experiência da Jacobin, da revista que você dirigiu, como é que você poderia relatar a síntese do que é esse, essa uma uhum. década de uma revista que se propôs né, essa é, renovação da cultura marxista, especialmente entre os jovens leitores uhum. nos Estados Unidos? Muito do meu livro é, obviamente, um, 
the criticism explanation of, of capitalism as a, as a system inherently based on, on exploitation, um, explanation of capitalism as a system based upon a particular form of market uh, dependence, and then explaining how even the actions of, of capitalists themselves, uh, capitalists aren't um, beings driven by by greed or or or, or are, aren't completely uh, malign personalities, though many of them happen to be sociopathic. Uh, though it's not a necessary um, you know part of their condition, um, but they're they're forced that way by market um, uh, imperatives. So, in other words, I do spend a lot of my time in the book. Um, criticizing capitalism and explaining it as a system. But I do think that that's, that's normally where texts like these end, right? They, they end with the criticism of capitalism and they take for granted that people will just believe that there is in fact a alternative. Um, so even, and this is where I, I definitely 100% agree with, with Nancy, and I do think the parallel she she drew was uh was very apt because i felt the same way when i was reading her work which is um that it was trying to make a intervention and drag people along to try to see a bigger picture so in my immediate milieu that i was speaking to a lot of them were young activists advocating for things like a 15 dollars minimum wage uh, who believed in in unions who believed in medicare for all and of course have a, have a host of other other beliefs, anti-racist beliefs, um, participants in, in fights for abortion rights, um, a whole host of, of, of things. But to say that if, in fact, you believe these things, then you need a certain tools to carry out the struggle effectively. And it's not that uh, you don't care about the right things. It's that even if this is what you want to achieve, you can't achieve this without injecting the dimension of class and without different forms of organization and and struggle. Um, so sometimes when more sectarian groups do it or from our comrades from the Trotskyist tradition propose like a, a transitional program, to me, it can sometimes feel like you're you're duping people. You're saying you're here for this. You're here for our campaign against the death penalty. But you're really going to hear us talk about um, revolutionary socialism because this is the this is getting at the root of the problem. You know, that's that's why we're we're radicals. We get to the the root of problems. Um, and I and I feel like I was trying to to I guess accomplish the same thing in a very different um, in a different way. Now, as far as the the subject. Uh, and this gets into the use of, of humor and also in a lot of my work and the work of my colleagues, like we often try to um, discuss things that are unrelated to to politics, like most people who follow my political writing know that I'm a fan of the New York Knicks. I know something about my personal life, know about my some of my other non very political passion and, and, and interest. And I think this is to. I guess, try to um, normalize socialism and being a socialist, that it isn't this all encompassing thing that that has to destroy every other other interest that you enjoy, uh, you know, be it theater or the arts or or sports or whatever, uh, whatever else. Um, and also, I think, in part, um, that gets to the approach of Jacobin, which is to try to have a aesthetic in terms of its look and feel, but also its writing that makes it accessible. And so you, you don't read an article and feel like, I'm too stupid to understand this. Maybe you'll read an article and you won't understand a few words or a few names or a few phrases, but you'll get the, the, the gist and you'll be challenged, but not stumped. And I think that's that's the best form of, of magazine writing, you know, as opposed to either more dense journal writing or on the other hand, more agitational um, pamphletarian. You know, I, I think we're, we're meant to be, be in between. But we'll, when it comes to audience, you know, we are operating in a context where there is no mass social base to our politics. Uh, and we have to acknowledge that in order to overcome that problem. It used to be that you could speak of a sociological subject uh, in the working class that didn't just exist in the economy, because I think the working class absolutely still exists in the majority in society at the point of production, but existed already as a political subject. So if you were an Italian socialist, let's say in the 70s and 80s or a communist, you could say, 
there is a sociological subject, the working class exists in the abstract, but also exists in practice as a political subject. And this political subject is already voting for reformist parties, either a communist party that's too reformist or a socialist party, which is reformist and corrupt, <laughs> but, but parties that programmatically are committed to some vision of socialism. And then we as revolutionary socialists are just trying to get them to go from supporting those parties with their corrupt reformist ways, or in the, in the case of communists, just kind of reformist ways, into a more radical program and a, and a different process of the, the, their organization, the transformation of their consciousness and, and whatever, whatever else. Now, I think in the United States, we are talking about one acts of almost micro resistance, which of course have still still exist on both the shop floor and in civil society. We're talking about fairly small by the standards of the world, social movements and sporadic social movements that are that are too often uh, largely media events. We're talking about uh, campaigns that get a lot of attention, but are kind of a mile wide and an inch deep in terms of being largely media events like the Sanders campaign. And I, by the way, I was a surrogate for the Sanders campaign, a supporter of the Sanders campaign, supporter of Black Lives Matter, supporter of, of all these movements. So I don't mean to diminish them in any way um, from a moral sense, but I think it's worth saying that what we have is the inkling of something, um, the very, um, the pre-movement, <laughs> the, um, but we don't really have that coherent of a subject. And obviously our goal is to try to rebuild one. And the people we're speaking to are, are really disproportionately, they're college educated, but they're not disproportionately wealthy kids. They're D-classed young professionals. Many of them are actually working class or workers. Many of them are teachers and nurses. Uh, so disproportionately, I would say we have a lot of union readers, but the union readers come from the white collar uh, professions. Uh, so, so there's a, a certain sociological generalizations you can make about our core readership for, let's say, Jacobin. But in general, because there is no coherent subject, there's a randomness to it. And the, the, the goal for us is how do we take this random motley association of, of, of movements and of, of people and individuals, and how do we cohere this into something that might help in the process of class reformation. So there's two different pulls right now. There's the main pull of class dealignment that I think center left parties all around the world are fueling. And this is paving the way for the right. Uh, then now you're seeing with Sanders, with Corbyn, you're seeing the attempt at some sort of class reformation, but, but largely failed attempts. But that's our, our mission uh, to fight, not only fight the alignment, but to reform it on a different uh, basis. But we can't take for granted that that um, the abstract um, uh, political subject of the worker uh, exists in the same way. But I, I, I definitely believe it can be reconstituted. So that's my main difference between me and maybe um, certain more populist thinkers, uh, for example, is it's in, in, in the faith and in reconstitution. The last thing I'll say is, in my mind, you could call it a left populist rhetoric. I would call it a producerist rhetoric is a good way to frame um, our broad orientation. But the point of this rhetoric is not to supplant traditional working class politics, in my mind, but it's to help reinvigorate it. Um, in, a, in a way. And I know that's a little bit vague, but but I, I think it it is a, a meaningful distinction between uh, the way in which we use populist rhetoric, uh, which, again, I think of in the mold of the way the Second International onward, radicals have always used broadly producerist rhetoric um, and um, a certain variety of left populist thinking that that aims to just say, the only subject that matters is that of the the people or the ninety nine percent, and and I I I I also would suspect that Nancy agrees with at least some of that because I feel like I, I understood her use of ninety nine percent throughout throughout the manifesto and her co authors uh, work that in that in that way. Muito bom. É, eu acho que as, a sua resposta ela permite uma série de comparações com o Brasil e com a América Latina, que resguardadas as diferenças, as distâncias da nossa formação e composição de classe, permitem entender certas unidades e certas, certos ritmos comuns. É muito, muito bom te ouvir, é, Basca. 
É, vou fazer três questões para a professora Fraser e, na sequência, uma grande questão para o professor é, Oswaldo Cordiola para que a gente feche essa reflexão é, a partir do Manifesto Comunista. E, na sequência, vou abrir o um espaço para quem quiser é, propor questões um, um ao outro, para que a gente tenha esse momento é, livre para a nossa troca. É, professora, te agradeço muito pela sua apresentação e, e te digo que eu estou muito curiosa para saber a respeito dessa cozinha da preparação desse poderoso manifesto feminista dos 99%. Gostaria muito de saber como ele foi feito, como ele foi concebido uh, e como... E, e isso porque, em parte porque a sua fala me suscitou, mas em parte também porque as 11 teses enunciadas me fazem pensar em um outro texto de Marx e não exatamente no Manifesto Comunista. Uh, que tem uma estrutura mais uh, blo blocada, né? uma estrutura de blocos uh, uh, maiores. Então, eu gostaria que você socializasse um pouco, se você se sentia à vontade. Uh, a segunda pergunta, ainda sobre o Manifesto Feminista, é sobre a linguagem populista, ou essa imprecisão sociológica, porém precisão política do texto, né? essa, essa estratégia retórica, é, como é que ela poderia se desenvolver no momento atual? Né? É, é, é preciso, é, é possível desenvolver a linguagem política numa, num, dando um passo além do populismo contido no manifesto, sem perder a força retórica desse texto? Né, se, se pudéssemos avançar na concepção de textos políticos no, feministas, para onde isso iria hoje? E, e pergunto sabendo que entre as feministas brasileiras, esse manifesto suscitou uma reação muito positiva e poderosa. Ele foi lançado, eu não sei se você sabe disso, em vários estados, com várias atividades políticas, e ele segue sendo uma referência para um conjunto grande de feministas socialistas e marxistas no Brasil que acho que gostariam de te ouvir mais a respeito da linguagem e dos seus também limites e possibilidades. E a terceira pergunta é, é uma provocação. A, a, a última tese do manifesto, a décima primeira, ela conclui com a ideia de uma insurgência anticapitalista comum. E ela é uma ideia vaga para mim e me parece até menos precisa do que a ideia política contida no Manifesto Comunista. Não tanto pela questão sociológica, mas mais pela questão em termos políticos. Então, o que é, o que é falar, o que significa falar de uma insurgência anticapitalista comum a partir de uma perspectiva feminista? Well, thank you, Daniela. These are all very um, interesting and um, not so easy, some of these questions. Um, in, in terms of the, the sort of how, how the, the process of, of writing, um, well, how did we decide to do it? Um, we had, um, the three of us had, had co-authored a, um, a little um, statement that um, was signed by several other Uh, well-known feminist, but that appeared in The Guardian um, very soon after uh, Trump's election and very soon after that huge women's march with all the pussy hats and so on and so forth. Um, and we had the sense that, um, that there was a tremendous outpouring of, you know, uh, desire to act. Uh, Uh, within the feminist movement and beyond it, for that matter, and that um, and that also that Trump's victory had really um, shattered a certain kind of liberal complacency, and we thought that this was uh, a, a a great moment 
to try to do something that uh, would help a process already underway, uh, begun in, in, in Poland uh, and elsewhere in Argentina, uh, to repoliticize International Women's Day, which had become a kind of a joke, you know, buy flowers for your secretary kind of a thing, whereas it actually has roots in the socialist labor movement. Um, and um, so we wrote something uh, for International Women's Day. And this is just one of those weird things that happen. I was actually doing some of the final editing and I just thought this is too dull. This needs some pizzazz. And so I just start throwing in feminism, the phrase feminism for the 99%. And Tithi and Chinzia liked it. And uh, I don't know, it just clicked. It was it was not a thought out thing. It's just one of those flashes of inspiration or whatever. And um, based on the success of this little thing, um, we got involved in this organizing for International Women's Strike, the, this new repoliticized uh, inter International Women's Day uh, thing, March 8th. Um, now, I have to say that both Achinzia and Tithi are real activists. Uh, Chinzia comes out of the uh, independent uh, socialist Italian left with a long history of working her way through various sectarian groups and so on. And uh, Tithi uh, belongs to a Marxist a socialist organization. Um, I am really much less of an activist than they are. I'm a real philosopher, but I do, as I hinted at before, I do have a red past, say. Um, and um, I don't know. I just thought um, something is cooking now. It's a different moment. If I were, if I'm ever going to sort of, you know, retrieve my militant spirit, this has got to be it. Um, and, you know, in, in the process, like every co-authored thing, you know, we have agreements, and disagreements. We we actually had an ar argument about the Jacobins, <laughs> not about your magazine, but about the, the French Jacobins and about the terror. I, we all sorts of little phrases would provoke disagreements. And, you know, we managed to sort of just eliminate the whole phrase about the, the French terror. Um, so. Uh, there was a there was a tremendous amount of agreement, and we each brought different strengths to the the thing. I mean, uh, uh, Chinzia had had written this very interesting um, little book about the, the the history of the unhappy marriage between feminism and, and socialism. Tithi had been uh, interested in um, the relation between class and gender and social reproduction. I had been doing this expanded theory of capitalism uh, with uh, that social reproductive crisis and ecological crisis. And there were every bit as much forms of capitalist crisis as stock market crashes and economic depressions. Um, anyway, it, it, it all uh, fit together. And I'm really glad that we did it. And it did have this rather enormous um, worldwide, it's been translated into 25 languages, uh, recently appeared in Russian and Arabic in all kinds of uh, languages. And um, I don't know how ephemeral it is because it, that was a specific moment. I think it's still very relevant. Uh, uh, I hope it will still be read, um, at least by some strange little pockets of people in 50 years, but it may not be exactly relevant to that moment in the way I think it is now. Um, moving to your second question, I liked this formulation that you gave of the attempt to combine sociological imprecision with political precision. That's very interesting. Um, how do we do this today? Well, I mean, I'm not a fan of sociological imprecision because once I finished my work on this, I went back uh, to my ordinary um, sort of more, you know, conceptual theoretical work, which is, you know, involves a, a lot of um, attempts anyway. It's more sociological precision. Um, and a mo the most recent thing I've done was to try to do for political ecology, 
but in a very academic mode, what uh, the, the manifesto tried to do for feminism, that is to argue uh, that it has to be anti-capitalist and it has to be, and I use the word trans-environmental, meaning not a single issue thing, but that is really uh, probes the, the, um, the deep entanglements of ecological issues with issues of labor and income security and of uh, gender and of uh, race and empire. Um, so I'm not going to be, I've, I'm, I've had, I'm finished with manifestos for the moment, but if somebody else would write environmentalism for the 99% or these various other things, I think these could be useful. Um, and then and the last thing I want to say something, you talked about the, the vagueness of this idea of an anti-capitalist insurgency, and I agree with you that that's uh, much too vague. So let me throw out another idea that I've been playing with. Um, and it's an idea that struck me um, last year when I was teaching Du Bois uh, Black Reconstruction. And those of you who know the book, which to my mind is like up there with Trotsky's history of the Russian revolution, one of the great works of Marxist history. Um, it, it starts with the idea um, that there were two labor movements um, that failed to recognize each other in their kindredness and to a lie. And, and he meant uh, abolition, which was a, a movement uh, to transform the slave labor and the, um, the uh, burgeoning uh, trade union and labor movement of exploited wage workers. And I suddenly thought, wow, but there's a third labor movement. And it too has not been recognized or even seen itself as a labor movement exactly. And that's social reproductive labor. So here's an idea I'm throwing out that we, we could pose the question of how to um, think politically about making these three labor movements. Uh, and now we, we're not talking about slavery, but the various forms of dependent, coerced, expropriated labor that still exists. How to make these three labor movements see each other as such, or see themselves as, as such. And um, I thought when I just listened to Bhaskar, who spoke about using producerist rhetoric, I, I, then I thought to myself, ah, but we're using reproducerist rhetoric. But these are both ways of talking about our labor and what we contribute and how we make the world and how our the fruits of our efforts are um, taken from us and um, go to build the hostile power that uh, stands over us. So anyway, that might be one line to pursue. It's obviously not the only one. É muito instigante é, toda a sua resposta, extremamente instigante e me faz ter vontade de ficar comentando aqui, especialmente essa parte final, incrível. É, vou fazer a pergunta, professor Oswaldo Codiola, e na sequência a gente pode abrir para uma conversa mais livre entre nós, entre vocês, né? eu aqui mediando humildemente. É, professor, você falou uma coisa que no fim das contas virou um fio condutor de toda a nossa conversa aqui, que é essa ideia do, do, do manifesto está voltando, né? do, do momento de reorganização, inclusive discursiva, simbólica, da indignação e da luta social. Uma brecha, portanto, em algo maior e que está em, em crise. Como é que você vê essa, esse retorno da política em sentido forte no Brasil? Como é que, qual é a sua análise dessa conjuntura do retorno à grande política, vamos dizer assim, dos manifestos na nossa realidade local? E se você quiser comentar internacionalmente também. Eu... Eh, vou aproveitar os, este pequeno espaço, certo? Para responder brevemente essa pergunta e para perguntar aos 
companheiros de mesa, certo? Já lançando o debate que você promete para fechar o evento, certo? Em primeiro lugar, em resposta à pergunta, nós tivemos um movimento geral no mundo em direção da extrema direita. Este movimento revelou ter menos fôlego do que parecia. Em algum momento, com a vitória de Trump nos Estados Unidos, de Bolsonaro no Brasil, de Duterte nas Filipinas, de Orban na Hungria, enfim, de um conjunto de governos que se definiam como de extrema direita e assumiam claramente essa identidade, chegou a se falar de uma internacional e liberal, ou seja, que a internacional, curiosamente, em vez de estar reposta pelo movimento operário a través do internacionalismo proletário, estava reposta pela extrema direita, como uma internacional e liberal. O que seria uma superação do velho fascismo, porque o velho fascismo nunca conseguiu fazer uma internacional, porque o velho fascismo era estritamente nacionalista, nacionalista alemão ou nacionalista italiano, certo? E era impossível se estruturar dentro de uma internacional. Se os fascistas ou eixo tivessem vencido a guerra, provavelmente a Segunda Guerra Mundial teria sido apenas o prólogo de uma terceira guerra entre os vencedores fascistas, certo? cada um lutando pela sua própria esfera de influência. E aqui não, se falava de uma internacional liberal. Ou seja, que não estávamos diante da simples reprodução do fenômeno histórico do fascismo. Isto não foi analisado em profundidade. E o que está acontecendo agora é que esta onda de extrema direita está se revelando com menos fôlego, e já da internacional e liberal nem se fala, porque caiu Trump, não caiu Duterte, não caiu Orban, Bolsonaro, segundo alguns está com os dias contados, certo? Provavelmente em 2022, se chegamos a essa data, se não houver um impeachment antes, tem grandes possibilidades de ser derrotado. E grande parte do que Bolsonaro impulsionou na América Latina, principalmente o golpe de Estado na Bolívia, foi totalmente derrotado, foi uma catástrofe, certo? O que foi e que terá sido esse episódio de extrema direita, se ele finalmente concluir de algum modo? Se ele finalmente concluir de algum modo, será um grande revelador político. Alguém disse que com Bolsonaro o que voltava era a política, certo? Porque quando se fez o impeachment de Dilma Rousseff, se esperava que os que o capitalizariam seriam os impulsionadores do impeachment. E aconteceu que o que capitalizou não foi os, 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 os tucanos, enfim, os partidos tradicionais, ditos chamados fisiológicos, mas que o capitalizou foi um outsider de extrema direita, certo? Que ganhou as ruas fazendo política, certo? Muito bem. Portanto, estamos em que? Como poderíamos caracterizar esta fase? Como uma fase de transição. E a palavra transição aqui é o emprego no seu pleno sentido, inclusive naquele que foi mencionado por Bascar muito rapidamente, se referindo, certo? aos companheiros que têm sua origem no trotskismo e que se referem a um programa de transição. Bom, eu me situo entre esses companheiros para deixar as coisas bem claras, certo? Então, agora de que transição estamos falando? De uma transição que tem características que são diversas de todas as transições precedentes na história, certo? Então, aproveito o que eu queria dizer, formulando uma forma de perguntas, certo? Tanto para Nancy como para Bascar, para não me estender muito, certo? Em primeiro lugar, para Nancy, que lança um manifesto que se assume claramente como feminista. Eu vou colocar a minha pergunta da seguinte maneira. Existe atualmente... Não apenas um movimento feminista, um movimento de libertação homossexual, um movimento negro, enfim, movimentos das que são chamadas minorias, mas também uma crítica a esses movimentos. Há uma crítica, e a crítica que eu diria que é predominante, de um caráter, no meu entendimento, vulgar. O que, que diz essa crítica? Os movimentos que põem a identidade racial, sexual, cultural, de gênero, enfim, na frente da identidade de classe, nas condições da sociedade capitalista, na qual a questão decisiva é exatamente a questão de classe e da exploração de classe, cometem um erro. Simplesmente porque cometem o erro de antepor 
una identidad y que en la OEA de clase hay identidad de clase. ¿Por qué usamos esta crítica de vulgar? Usamos esa crítica de vulgar porque, vamos a decir, porque para decirlo claramente, no respeta el principio establecido por el gran sociólogo marxista Lucian Goldman, ¿cierto? que dice lo siguiente, para una teoría, si mostrar superior a otra, debe ser capaz no apenas de criticarla, mas también de explicarla. O sea, si vos critica el feminismo sin explicar o feminismo, vos no supera el feminismo burgués, ¿cierto? Vos tiene que explicar la existencia y cuáles son las bases de ese movimiento para poder superarlos en un movimiento que os integre. Y en ese sentido, la superación no sería una superación pero pura y simple negación, pero sería una superación en el sentido hegeliano, una superación conservación, ¿cierto? Muy bien. Aquí, por tanto, uh, entonces, yo pregunto, para... ¿cuáles serían, do punto de vista, yo fico muy interesado por él haber dicho específicamente, ¿cierto?, que eh, la propuesta es de Nancy, asumidamente populista de izquierda, pero que permite que tenga un fuerte y poder movilizador, ¿cierto? Y ese termo de reivindicación de populismo de izquierda proviene de un teórico, la verdad, de un dos teóricos, Ernesto Laclau y Chantal Mouffe, y yo quiero esclarecer a Nancy que yo pertenecí como argentino, no veo una, una longínqua juventud, a un mismo partido político de Ernesto Laclau, ¿cierto? Que también tiene un origen trotskista, dígase de pasaje, ¿cierto? Cosa que muchas personas ignoran, ¿cierto? Muy bien. ¿Cómo sería, ¿cierto? No sé, un punto de vista porque estamos hablando de populismo y estamos hablando de jacobinismo, tenemos una persona que reivindica el populismo de izquierda como un punto de partida movilizador y un representante de una revista que se llama Jacobin, ¿cierto? que se llama Jacobino. Y lo que me coloco, la pregunta que hago a Nancy y la pregunta que hago para Vázquez, es la misma cosa, ¿cómo superar a partir de su poder movilizador, más superar, o populismo y el jacobinismo, ¿cierto? Cómo superar el populismo de izquierda, ¿cierto? Y el jacobinismo político. Y la pregunta para Vázquez, ¿cierto? A partir de su poder movilizador. La pregunta para Vázquez, ¿cierto? Es la siguiente. Yo leí con extremo interés todo el relato que él hace de la movimentación que se dio en torno a la candidatura de Bernie Sanders en los Estados Unidos, ¿cierto? Colocó un alcance que no tenía ido a lo largo del último século a idea del socialismo para, o, eh, para la sociedad norteamericana. Yo gusté mucho de toda parte en que él se refiere al pasado, en que el Partido Socialista llegó a tener 6% de los votos nacionales y llegó a tener 2% de los votos en la ciudad de Chicago. Y cómo esa tradición fue perdida para un socialismo totalmente integrado y que no ultrapasa una condición absolutamente marginal. Pero nosotros tuvimos una situación en no el mundo que fue extraordinaria con la candidatura de Bernie Sanders. En no medio de una onda de extrema derecha, Bernie Sanders concorre en las primarias del Partido Demócrata y era considerado un serio candidato y caso tuviese vencido esas primarias y posteriormente derrotado Trump en las elecciones generales, no estaríamos un paradoxo, un paradoxo enorme. Las dos grandes potencias del mundo estarían gobernadas, en un caso, por un socialista y en otro caso, el caso de la China, por un comunista. Entonces, ¿de qué extrema directa estamos hablando si las dos grandes potencias irían a ser gobernadas por personas que se reivindican comunista y socialista, o sea, de izquierda? Ahora, lógicamente que se trata de un movimiento lleno de contradicciones. La idea de ese programa transitorio, no me voy a entendimiento, es muy simple. Yo quiero concluir con esto para explicar bien a mi pregunta. Yo expliqué que la novedad del manifesto comunista consistía en que no intentaba explicar el comunismo, porque el comunismo ya existía, sino en, a partir del análisis de los factos y los procesos, ¿Por qué el comunismo era necesario, era la transición necesaria entre la situación, o punto de llegada de una transición necesaria entre la situación del capitalismo, ¿cierto? Sus contradicciones y el futuro de la humanidad, ¿cierto? 
E o programa de transição tem uma ideia força fantástica, que é exatamente a mesma do Manifesto Comunista. Partir não de um ideal, mas das condições reais, para traçar uma ponte em direção do futuro. Certo? Nessas condições, esse é o pressuposto da minha pergunta. E a minha pergunta é a seguinte, depois de todo o movimento, que se frustrou com a candidatura de Bernie Sanders, mas de modo temporário, como se articula nos Estados Unidos a questão que é decisiva, eu diria, não para o futuro dos Estados Unidos, mas para o futuro de toda a humanidade? Entre essa movimentação socialista, que é o movimento em torno de Bernie Sanders, certo? Evidenciou, e a possibilidade de se constituir nos Estados Unidos uma força política que seja explicitamente de classe, ou seja, que reivindique o socialismo, certo? E se reivindique organicamente da classe dos trabalhadores assalariados. Essa é a minha pergunta, certo? E são as duas perguntas. Essentially, what I would say is that the U.S. is a country with a almost entirely defeated left. It was a country with a left so defeated that we thought that the subject was dead. And then we found out with the Sanders campaign and with the upsurges that have occurred since occupied in the United States that uh, we weren't dead, but we were in fact in a coma or, or on life support. Um, so we are still a very long way away from being this this hope um but obviously not because i'm a um um uh, a, a nationalist a national chauvinist in any way but just because of the simple fact that uh the us is where capital is most developed it's also where our struggle against capital will be the most um important uh, for the for the destiny um of of humanity um and and the us and and, and china um, with with Brazil and India not too far behind, I guess. Um, but fundamentally, our tasks are are simple, even in the wake of the defeat of the Sanders campaign. And it is this process of class formation, the process of creating a collective identity as workers broadly conceived um, among a mass of people who might be discontented, but very much feel um, that they are individuals individual discontented um, uh, people we want to turn into a collective um, subject. And electoral campaigns have been the primary way in which we've made that breakthrough. So there was a Sanders campaign at the presidential level, uh, but there were also tremendous breakthroughs that are still going on at the local level. And there were also strike activities like the teachers union strike. Uh, there's also activity, uh, especially among young people getting getting politicized, uh, Black Lives Matter being the most significant um, of them. So all of this is political activity that we um, think is is part of this process of, of, of class reformation. And there's particular work that socialists can do, even in lieu, we can't manufacture movements out of nothing, but we can engage in basic education, organizing, propaganda, and the very least with the Democratic Socials of America, we're still small, but we have 100,000 people that can constitute the base for that organizing, that education, and that, that propaganda, whereas before we had nothing. We only had maybe a few thousand people combined in all the, the organizations of the American left up until 2015, probably 10,000 combined. Today, I would put that number as, as well over 100,000 uh, active dues-paying um, uh, members of, of mostly the democratic socials of of America. Um, so, yeah, I think I think fundamentally this is the starting point for our um, our struggles. And to the extent we can look for president, it's we're looking all the way back to the 19th century, not for theoretical nostalgia, but because we are starting in a context where uh, the class exists, but in which the uh, there's almost no level of formal class organizing. Um, but I should say that that the context in which we're operating in is one in which civil society is extremely hollowed out, in which we have uh, very weak unions, very weak levels of church attendance. I'm an atheist. You know, I don't care about church attendance from the standpoint of, of you know, worshiping God, but I do care about it from the standpoint of having a sense of 
of, of community and belonging and, and kind of the activity. I think it's a symptom of something uh, much, much wider. Um, so in this void, uh, we're going to have to try to rebuild um, something. And we've gone a lot, a long way in the last five years. And obviously, if the next five years, we can make similar progress and we'll be in great shape. But if the Sanders campaign and if the, the protests of the past year were the peak of things and, and, and things just go into decline under Biden, then um, then we'll we'll see. But I, I tend to believe that the contradictions that have fueled the last five years of organizing are only getting more intense and, and there will be further leaps in organization and, and, and also consciousness. But I'll, I'll defer to uh, Nancy and let her get the last word. Thanks, Bhaskar, and thanks, Osvaldo, for uh, your questions. Um, so yeah, let me just say about the very briefly about the critique of feminism that you mentioned. Um, look, um, uh, feminism has a, a, a long history within capitalism, uh, and it, its most uh, recognized strands have always been bourgeois, have been uh, right the wives of, of property owning uh, men uh, and so on, including in some cases even the wives of slave owners who insisted that they should be able to buy and sell slaves while their husbands were away <laughs> fighting for the Confederacy. So um, for feminism has a very mixed history. It's also been entangled with imperialism, with uh, trying to uh, liberate brown women on the other side of the world from, from brown men who, who mistreat them. Um, but there have also always been other currents of feminism. And I just mentioned International Women's Day as a, a, a right originating from the, the, the socialist uh, uh, feminist wing of the labor movement. Um, what's happened, um, and this is related to what Bosco was saying about the weakness of the left. Um, what, what, feminism is deeply affected at, in any period by the larger political context, including the strength or weakness of a socialist left. In the absence of a socialist left, it um, often um, becomes uh, simply liberal, trying to remove discrimination, let talented individual women rise to the top, meritocracy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and um, we, we've had the, this problem where the sort of official labor movement in countries like the U.S. had become weakened, the, the weakening of unions and so on, um, during the period that these other new social movements uh, right, flourished, including feminism. And those social movements developed in a context without a strongly class conscious and class struggle oriented left. And they were deformed as a result, I would say. Um, I think we would have at least had more of a fight within feminism if there had been strong unions and uh, left uh, class oriented organizations and parties. So, um, as as as, uh, as somebody just said, um, you don't. We're not in a position to create social movements. They arise, you know, more or less spontaneously. Although, of course, with a lot of hard work. But you know, um, and and they reflect the concerns, uh, uh, the specific contradictions and impasses that people face in their lives. Um, many of them have the potential to, um, to develop insofar as they are uh, find their way to a more systemic structural understanding of the society and of their place in it. And um, if they don't find that, they can get all caught up in you know, a real uh, identitarian and quasi-authoritarian and cancel culture and, you know, focusing on little microaggressions and all of that for, for the lack of a big picture. So I think one thing that, that Bhaskar is doing that I admire so much and that I, in my own much smaller scale way, try to do 
is 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 try to create larger maps on which social actors can locate themselves through which they can see connections that might not be obvious in their immediate experience and uh, through which they can think differently about, you know, who their enemies are, who their allies are, how to coordinate, how to make connections. So that's how I see uh, that question. Uh, one um, quick point about um, Leclau and Mouf. Uh, um, Leclau was, was a dear friend and, and Chantal still is. Um, I, I, I'm not a populist in their sense at all. For one thing, um, I, I love their theory of hegemony, but it's it's only a theory of hegemony. It's not a theory of society, and they mistook it for a theory of society. I am a critical social theorist. I believe in social structure, in institutional framework, and, uh, and all of that. Where I agree with them is that that structure doesn't secrete political identity, class consciousness, et cetera, et cetera. But um, uh, there's something uh, that is too, um, uh, that, that, that uh, d dissolves structure too easily. And, and you, you, you couldn't, I mean, I've been talking about the need for a more precise sociology, and by that, I mean the social structure. And I also don't think that, um, that the category of the people is a useful category, which is what uh, right Leclau uh, essentially uh, was thinking about. The the ninety nine percent and the one percent is um, at, at the very least um, selecting out the one percent is a shorthand for Wall Street. It's it's at least selecting out some uh, sociological group. It doesn't have an adequate understanding of what that group does how their actions cause the big hot mess that that we're all in. It doesn't have an adequate understanding of, um, you know, what you would need to do to actually take away the power of the one percent. It's not about putting some junk bond traders in, in jail or raising taxes on them or whatever. Um, so that's why I said before that I, I, I'm not really a populist. Um, and I sort of realized that I should have said in, in relation earlier to Daniela that there actually is some sociological um, precision in this book. Uh, it, 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 it has that, um, you know, that, uh, that title and, and, and occasionally does use that rhetoric, but um, it, it, there's a lot of talk about the capitalist class in this book, with not the one percent, and 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 an attempt to give some sort of picture of what they do and uh, what gives them their power and and so on and so forth. So um, the only other thing um, I guess I want to say, last very quick point. Um, uh, I, I mean, I agree very much with uh, with Bhaskar about um, the need for organizations with a left perspective. And um, my worry has to do with something you said earlier, which is about time. Uh, if, we, if we had five more years to get to 100,000 and then another five years to a million and so on and so forth, but the 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 climate clock is uh, ticking, and um, my my thought is that in times of very acute crisis, we have to. It's just a bet. We 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 can't know, but we have to bet on the hope that social learning speeds up fast, because um, things get so dire. And um, and become so unlivable that um, something has to give, and and the, my biggest worry is that despite the current weakness of the extreme right, and I agree with Oswaldo that their situation is uh, not as rosy as it looked a few, couple of years ago, uh, but I, I still think that um, that they're uh, they're the danger. Uh, waiting for us. 
uh, a little further down the road. So that something like the old choice socialism or barbarism remains the uh, you know the choice that we face, and that brings me to think um, that of course we want to present socialism as the good life and and give that a palpable and attractive feel but I, i'm i'm in such a, a a mood uh to turn instead to walter benjamin maybe what we mean by socialism is simply pulling the brake the emergency brake on the runaway train maybe it's just enough to present the worst that might not be an a, an appealing way to organize people but i think it might be sort of an accurate read on where we are right now Muito obrigada, professora Fraser, Basca e Codiola, Basca Suncari e Codiola, por essa incrível atividade é, emergencial para nós de discussão sobre esses dois manifestos. É, acredito que a mensagem mais importante é, desse encontro, né, os movimentos sociais, eles não são criados, eles emergem e ao emergir preciso encontrar uma contracultura que seja o mais rigorosa possível, cirurgicamente precisa, e essa precisão hoje é falar de um mundo que colapsa. Então, que esses manifestos possam percorrer o Brasil, possam continuar expandindo seu alcance, no caso do Manifesto Feminista, e expandir-se pela juventude, pelos jovens socialistas, no caso do Manifesto Socialista, e os não, não tão jovens, jovens também, para que a gente possa formar a cultura ou a contracultura, a contra-hegemonia necessária para confrontar um mundo em colapso e que afeta não só a nossa sociedade no seu modelo econômico, mas na sua própria existência física. Então, um abraço a vocês, espero que... Fiquem bem nessa situação de pandemia terrível que vivemos e até uma próxima. E parabéns a Boitempo, toda a equipe que organizou essa atividade e, e toda a programação de comemoração do aniversário de Karl Marx. Um abraço. Thank you, everybody. It was great to talk to uh, you two guys, to all three of you. And, thank and you. Thank you um, for, for having us. And yeah, it was nice seeing everyone. It's been a while. Yeah. Obrigado. Gracias. Obrigado. Gracias. Thank you. Merci. Nice meeting you all. Nice seeing you, Bhaskar. It's been a while. Yes. Nice seeing you.